Hi, I'm Tim Dolbear, and we're here at Lacquer Channel Mastering in Toronto, Canada. I can take your rising sun to my back on everyone. Here at Lacquer Channel Studios in Toronto, Canada, to interview Noah Mintz about his mastering studio, his workflow, and everything he has done in this day-to-day -day process. So let's go inside. Wonder do they look at mine? Or do they see this wedding ring? Uh, my name is Noah Mintz. I'm a uh, mastering engineer at Lacquer Channel Mastering. I've been mastering uh, at this point for 13 years. Certainly best. Uh, Lacquer Channel has been around for well, 35 years now. So it, it's got a long, long hi history. Fantastic. Tell me some of the projects that have come through here. Um, well, uh, originally, like, like some of the projects that Lacquer Channel has done that everyone would know is... Um, um, all those, a lot of those early Rush albums, like uh, mm -hmm. Farewell to Kings, Twenty One Twelve, um, Peter Gabriel's first album was done here. Um, even the Canadian release of U 2s one of U 2s albums was here. Joshua Tree. Yeah, and I'm um, uh, just ton of albums. And like George Graves, our chief engineer, he, I mean, he's cut everything. Like he's cut. Uh, someone sent an email the other day saying that. He picked up a copy of one of uh, Led Zeppelin's albums. I, I don't remember which one. Uh, maybe it was Houses of the Holy, but then he was like, uh, he was like, yeah, I was able to get a cut that George Graves did. It sounded better than all the other cuts, you know? And it's like a whole different world then because people like, you know, in each region cut, did a different cut because you, know, you couldn't use the same lacquer for every master when they had big releases, so you'd do different lacquers. So, and George did everything from like Public Enemy to, 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 to Led Zeppelin, to Grateful Dead, to everything. And uh, myself, um, ones that uh, some people might know, I guess, is I, I've done uh, a good portion of the Broken Social Scene albums. And um, did a band uh, called The National from Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. um, they did like a, a DVD EP, which was a 12 song EP. Um, I done worked on bands, um, Canadian bands, Blue Rodeo, Great Big C. Um, I mean, there's there's so many. The thing about mastering is, it's like two to three hundred albums a year, right? And um, three, two to three hundred artists a year. Maybe not two to three hundred albums, but it's so easy to forget who you've yeah. done. I've done like you know like like I've worked on Friends albums like like Hayden and Howie Beck, who are you know pretty well known Canadian musicians in their own right. Um, and I've done albums that you know people I, I no one's ever heard of, but are like some of my favorite albums. You know, right? Uh, right now, today I'm working on a band called Forest City Lovers. Probably their third album I've done, and they're one of my favorite bands. Like they're incredible, and it's like so. It's always a pleasure to, you know, your favorite albums to get to, favorite artists to get to work on them. But even in the same respect, sometimes you work on a, a, a favorite artist like Broken Social Scene's a great example, and they their newest album they. They recorded and produced in the U.S., so mm -hmm. decided to stick with the 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 mastering engineer that their producer usually uses in Arizona. So, you know, and that's fine too. You know, it's like it's great to see a band's progression. And like I said, it's only really only one day usually. Right. So, you know, it's like uh, it's great to have you know client loyalty. Um, however, you know, if certainly I. I if I was mastering my own albums, I'd go somewhere different every time myself. So it uh, right. depends what you're, if, if you want to go with the unknown or go with the known. Right. Cool. How'd you get into mastering? Um, well, I was in a band um, and um, I saw that the, that the uh, mastering process was the uh, shortest and the uh, somewhat most lucrative. Uh, and I like the gear. <laughs> I like the knobs, uh, the big knobs, and uh, um, it just, in, you know, as a bit of a geek, and a bit of a nerd, figured it was the best part of uh, technology and music, uh, and it was a bit of a calling too, I think mastering is uh, something you, you know, you, uh, a lot of mastering engineers, they... Uh, they don't do mixing or recording or producing, and I don't do any of those. Um, uh, at least traditionally, they've been that way, and it's sort of been it's sort of it's sort of a bit of a calling. You have to want to work on a different band every single day. So 
uh, that was uh, that's how I bit got into it. And I just I love listening to a whole album for over and over and over again for a day. So that's cool. Did you start as a musician? Yeah, I was in uh, a guitar and sang in a band um, and songwriting, and I still do it. Cool. Um, but uh, I, I I don't do it obviously professionally anymore. But uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I think for many engineers, it's a natural progression to go from uh, being a, a recording musician into uh, being a recording engineer. Awesome. What else are you going to do? You can <laughs> st start studying law, which has been done before too, I guess. Yeah. Great. Well, tell me about your workflow here. Tell me about Signal Chain. And, and um, well, uh, my, uh, my chain for mastering, uh, I, I try to keep it simple. Um, it stayed this way uh, for about four years. It was a pretty big milestone as far as... I've added some gear and I've taken it out and there's been a couple few th a few things have come in in the past little while but I try to stick with one thing I try to stick with a workflow I have a couple pieces I use all the time and a couple pieces are a little bit superfluous that I'll use uh, every once in a while that are good to have uh, basically what I do is I uh, I have two copies of Sequoia open I'm using a Sequoia 10 right now and um, the copy on top uh, is my playback and my copy on the bottom is my record. Um, the advantage of that is my um, top copy, my playback um, copy can have any sample rate I want. And my record can have a fixed sample rate, which is usually 44.1, although um, I've been doing a little bit 88.2, especially if uh, people are going to cut to uh, to lacquer for um, vinyl production. Um, and uh, I have two separate clocks for that. So um, um, what I'm using for clock is a uh, DCS. All my converters and my clocks are, are DCS, uh, an English company. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so basically I load in files. Uh, if it's not coming in on, on tape, I load in files and uh, play back off the Sequoia. It goes out into my uh, Crookwood system, uh, which is an analog uh, digital uh, hybrid. Um, and then usually goes into a, a Neve mastering EQ. That's a 2708 from when we used to have uh, Neve mastering consoles. Mm -hmm. And uh, then it goes to the Dangerous Master, which allows me to have uh, three different um, uh, analog inserts plus an input and output. And then I run basically, this is a Muth uh, Engineering, uh, the guy behind Dangerous Music. Okay. It's a Baxendahl EQ. There's a production model. This is a is, is prototype. There's a production model coming out like basically any day now, so okay. uh, really cool. Basically, it's like a bass and treble knob for your stereo, except uh, super high quality. Yes, sounds amazing. Again, like with mastering, really simple equipment tends to be the really simple high quality equipment tends to be the best sort of route. And then my sort of workhorse EQs, which are GML and Sontech. Sontech being like, I guess the holy grail of uh, of of mastering EQs, and this is an original. Uh, uh, one from the 70s, uh, and then the GML 9500 Mastering EQ, which is sort of the gold standard in Mastering EQs. Very clean, very precise, uh, pretty awesome. Um, and then um, an SPL Passive EQ, which I actually use at the end of my chain. Um, pretty neat, has um, three bands of cut and three bands of boost. Um, that's basically the meat and potatoes of what I use for EQ and then um, uh, for compression, I use uh, just really only two analog compressors, uh, a Manly Verimu um, tube compressor and a Chandler Limited uh, LTD2, which is like a Neve style compressor. I generally don't use them together and uh, uh, at least one or the other, just get two different sort of flavors. Um, and generally mostly for just the sound of them. I, I try not to use compression too often, really a little bit, just right. a little touch of compression if I need it. Most stuff comes in fairly compressed these days, so right. just doesn't need it. Um.